I affirm, resolved, in the United States criminal justice system, truth-seeking ought to take precedence over attorney-client privilege, and value morality as ought indicates a moral obligation. There's no such thing as an absolutely true ethical statement. Our facts are simply what is valuable to accept as true. Morality has no truth value beyond its usefulness. Statements of value are simply statements of preference. To compare these, a criterion of decided preference should be applied. The conclusion is utilitarianism with an emphasis on higher pleasures. Thus, the way we come to know value epistemolo epistemologically and practically is through a utility preference. Prefer epistemic arguments because they concern how knowledge is created. Epistemology necessarily comes first because if our process of attaining knowledge is indeterminate or flawed, we can't trust that our conclusions are valid. Thus, the standard is maximizing well-being. My thesis and sole contention is that our current justice system does not maximize the well-being of those put, put onto trial due to the high false imprisonment rates. Instead, the affirmative advocates it would be more utilitarian to adopt a system like France that has low false conviction rates. Subpoint A is America. False convictions are mainly caused by the problems in our system based on attorney-client privilege. Attorney-client privilege limits attorneys from exonerating clients which they know are innocent. Joy. Attorney-client privilege has been used to prevent lawyers from revealing information that could prevent the wrongful incarceration of another. Privilege becomes an issue when a lawyer seeks to testify in court about what the lawyer knows that may exonerate the accused. Clients who are innocent are disadvantaged with attorney-client privilege, while guilty clients get the benefits. Fischl. An argument made by someone known to be an advocate is less credible than someone who is expressing his own beliefs. Confidentiality penalizes citizens with nothing to hide. Such clients would like their attorneys to communicate credibly that nothing is being hidden, but confidentiality makes this impossible. Attorneys of low-quality clients rely on confidentiality, making it more difficult for the decision-maker to distinguish between the two. High rates of wrongful convictions lead to more people who are let out of prison. However, innocent people are still seen in the system as felons and then exiled to a life of poverty and crime. Healy. Sealing or clearing a criminal record after a wrongful conviction is an expensive process. Felony convictions remain on federal databases and pop up during background checks or traffic stops. A criminal record can impede employment. Clearing a criminal record can take years and cost thousands. Many require that defendants return to court to prove their innocence. With hundreds of men and women now freed from prison by DNA tests, more states are grappling with the questions of how to present former prisoners, prevent former prisoners from slipping into poverty. A study of 118 exonerated inmates found that high percentages of the wrongfully convicted slide into poverty or substance abuse as they struggle to rebuild a life outside prison. Subpoint B is France. The system in France is the most utilitarian and ensures the protection of innocent defendants while upholding high percentages of true verdicts. France's criminal justice system is built with safeguards to protect innocent defendants. Bandus. The explicit function of French judges is to search for, tr for the truth, a role that has no parallel in the adversary system. The French system builds in protections against tunnel vision. It engages in early and frequent substantive screening of criminal cases. If the case proceeds to trial, there is no plea bargaining available. The trial is regarded not as a dispute between two parties, but as a way to determine guilt or innocent. The French model also has some of the highest percent of real convictions. Women writes, in France, the innocent are rarely charged. 95% of guilty defendants are convicted. Public confidence in the system is high. In the U.S., upwards of 4% of the prison population is innocent. With some on death row, but more than half of the guilty defendants get off. Thus, I affirm. is an obligation. The United States government is the only way to determine obligations in the context of the resolution. The United States is not bound by the same moral obligations as the individual agents. The government is made up of many multiple actors, so it cannot be held morally culpable. It would be illogical to hold a senator, a senator morally culpable for actions taken by the Senate if they voted against it. Even if the affirmative says that the accountability is important, this would not be sufficient to prove our moral culpability itself is one possible for the government, and two more important than the culpability of, that the government has to offer for has to its other obligations. Consent determines moral obligations, but the government cannot consent to morality as a, as a whole. Therefore, it is not bound to the same obligations of upholding morality as an individual is. Even if the affirmative gives reasons why the government acts consistently with morality, it would have to prove that the cause of the of the actions is more of more is morality, and they don't. And if they don't, then it would simply be correlation. The government physically can't self-reflect moral theories that relate to rationality and reason that do not apply to governments. This preempts any means-based moral theories as governments cannot act in accordance with them. In order to access a rationality-based uh, based moral theory, the affirmative would need to prove that a government is a, is a rational actor capable of self-reflection. The only obligations that apply to the United States government are those found in the Constitution. So point A, disregarding the Constitution in terms of the debate round 
would make it possible for us to discuss governmental actions because we have no other notion of what the government ought to do outside of the Constitution. Just as baseball does not make sense absent the rules of the game, neither does the United States government absent the Constitution. This means that I always preempt the affirmative framework because constitutional obligations are, pre are a prerequisite to understanding the implications of the actions taken. So point B, we must also look to the actions being aligned with constitutionality before any other impacts of those actions. If they aren't proven constitutional, then the government would have no reason to take those actions preempting to any other type of impact analysis. Sub point C, the Constitution always controls the strongest link to the epistemic argument since it leaves no room for ambiguity the way that we come to know obligations. Epistemology is the basis for understanding moral rights or wrongs, and thus comes first. The standard is abiding by the constitutional obligations. The negative burden is to simply prove that the status quo is constitutional. The privilege presents, the, thus I contend that the, that the right to attorney-client privilege is one provided by the Constitution and would be unconstitutional to see it as a violable act. The privilege prevents the state from infringing upon, upon for personal freedom. Gardner writes, there is a notion of fair trial with adequate, with adequate representation. There is serious doubt as to whether this is possible unless it is freedom for the client and his attorney to pre prepare the case without the knowledge and interference of the state. If the privilege are taken away, the lawyers may, in many instances, would be hard to, to put to make a fight worthy of a fee. Thus, the man's right on his day in court would be seriously infringed. The Fifth Amendment provides basis for attorney-client privilege. Hartman writes, the Fifth Amendment offers the clearest support for the attorney-client privilege. Early American criminal courts and legal scholars viewed the attorney-client privilege as an outgrowth of the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. The link is clear. The Fifth Amendment supports a constitutional attorney-client privilege for reason beyond self-incrimination issues. Courts have suggested that the due process of component of Fifth Amendment includes the right of one of the one accused of crime to have the effective and substantial aid of counsel. a couple of questions for you. Um, so your value was justice, correct? Yes. All right. And then um, what was your value criterion again? Uh, upholding the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, okay, um, so in the Constitution, were you aware that there are um, parts of the Constitution that say that um, citizens can't quarter troops? Were you aware of that? Um, yes. Okay, um, but would you also agree that that's irrelevant now? Uh, that that may be irrelevant, but the ultimate message of the Constitution is still relevant. Just the tiny details may have been changed by times, but the ultimate message of the Constitution, which our country is built on, is still completely relevant in our society today. Okay, and then um, one more question. Um, so, how your value is justice, correct? Mm -hmm. um, but how do we know what is um, just unless we have some sense of what is morally um, wrong or right? Um, I'm sorry, what's the question? How do we know, um, how can we determine what is justice unless we know what morality it means? Um, well, we know what is just. If justice is, well, morality is um, something that, that we define, so our Constitution defines what is just and what isn't just. So it defines like what we should and shouldn't do according to the law, which our country is based on. Okay, thank you. That's all. And um, what is your value? Uh, my value is morality. And your value criterion is? Maximizing well-being. Okay, so um, what would happen if someone who um, wasn't, who was guilty, or who was guilty um, and they told their... Um, their lawyer that they were guilty, but then their lawyer would have to tell the court if the attorney-client privilege were not in place. They, the lawyer would have to tell the court that um, the person was guilty. How would that be fair to the person that well, was guilty? Um, well, if they were really guilty, then um, they should get the punishment that um, that they deserve for being guilty. So if they were actually guilty, um, then 
the verdict that is reached would be a correct verdict. Okay. Thank you. Do you guys need any prep time? Um, yes, please. Okay, just a minute, right? Okay. Can we count out a minute? Nor normally, debaters are due four minutes apiece in a normal debate. A normal debate is twice this length. Um, each side will get a cross X and uh, after each constructive speech. But we cut it down to just a single cross X um, just to, to shorten the speeches. And also, the, their length of speeches is significantly different. Um, but their next set of speeches will, you notice they read off of their computers their constructive speeches. Their rebuttals against each other will be a little different. So. And that's where you should really be listening, where the real clash should be taking place. Basically, your sole contention is that um, that morality, or that the correct uh, conclusion would come about because um, the person, the the um, if the person guilty would be chosen guilty. But the problem is, is that if the attorney-client privilege weren't put in place, um, the the person guilty wouldn't tell their lawyer. That um, that they were guilty because if if you were guilty of a crime, why would you tell your lawyer that would tell the court that you were guilty? Then you would go to jail. That makes no sense. So your sole contention is basically not going to um, fix anything because the person guilty still wouldn't tell the lawyer. So even so, the same amount of people would still go to jail. And the statistics, the, your whole point is that the statistics would change, but they actually wouldn't because it would not make any sense for someone to tell their lawyer that they were guilty if the lawyer was going to go turn around and tell the court. Um, so, and you also give France as an example, but France is the wrong size and there's no way to actually test it in the U.S. without actually getting rid of the attorney-client privilege and that would, um, that would take a lot of doing to, um, to have it happen in the U.S. And, um, and also, like, what if the, uh, if the uh, the guilty or even innocent didn't want to say whether they're guilty or innocent, but they would still be forced to say if um, the attorney-client privilege weren't taken away, um, they is um, it also is important to hold, uphold the rights of each individual. So you say that it would have an overall benefit, but it's important for to make sure because since this is America, like we need to. We need to include everyone and not just overall benefit. We need to um, uphold the rights of every single person, not just, oh, most people's rights are being upheld. We need to go in and make sure that every single person, um, their rights are being upheld. And um, to extend my arguments, um, so the Fifth Amendment, it's um, basically saying that, that it's basically... Um, what says that the attorney client privilege needs to be put in place, and we need to um, keep this in place because uh, the, the, the Constitution is what tells us what is right and what is not right, and so we have to make sure that we uphold the Constitution since it is what what makes our when because it, it it's our laws, and we have to follow the laws. If we are breaking the laws. Then there's there's it's just chaos and there's no sense of like what is right and what is wrong, uh, which is also what morality is, which is what you were saying before, um, and um, privilege prevents you from okay and so personal freedom 
So we each have the right to not tell the court, and every single person has the right to say that they're not guilty, and you, like, you, don't, you don't have to tell the court that you are guilty. So, so for the above reasons, I negate. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so my opponent's value is justice. However, um, my value of morality is more important. Um, because how do we know what is just without having a sense of what is morally right and morally wrong? Um, we're not able to determine what is just unless we know what's right and wrong. Because justice is like determining the right verdict, but how do we know what verdict is right unless we have a good sense of morality? And also, the people who wrote the Constitution um, were people who had morals. So they, naturally, they put those morals into the Constitution. So the Constitution already has that built in. Um, so all of those arguments are invalid. Um, so, and also my opponent was saying um, that the government can't reflect any moral theories. However, for um, in a democratic government, the Constitution um, we're looking for the well-being of the people. The government is for the people in a democracy. And so the Constitution needs to be able to do this. Um, it needs to be able to maximize well-being. And attorney-client privilege doesn't do this because with attorney-client privilege, people who are innocent or people who are guilty um, get falsely exonerated because they can't... Um, because their attorney always, there's always a chance that there's attor their attorney's hiding something um, from the jury, so the jury can never know for sure and never make a completely uh, like exact decision. So that um, falsely imprisons people, and after that, um, it leads to poverty because once you've been imprisoned, it's on your record and you can't get it off your record. Um, so it leads to that cycle. Um, so that's definitely not maximizing the well-being. So attorney-client privilege isn't doing that, and that's the whole point of the Constitution to maximize um, the well-being for the people. Also, um, my opponent in her set point A said, without the Constitution, the government is meaningless. However, like I was talking about before, the Constitution must change with the people, um, especially in a democracy. Um, it, needs to, it needs to be able to change with the people and reflect the people's morals. Otherwise, it's defeating the entire purpose. And um, as I brought up in Cross X, um, my opponent, um, or as I brought up in Cross X, quartering troops. There are parts of the Constitution that are no longer relevant. Um, and so, therefore, the Constitution needs to be able to change with the people. Um, so, parts of the Constitution, like attorney-client privilege, maybe aren't relevant anymore, and they need to be changed. And um, my opponent's whole constitutionality argument is invalid because if we change the Constitution, um, then all of those all of those things wouldn't be a problem anymore. Um, and lastly, um, my opponent was talking about um, someone who is guilty not being able to speak openly with their attorney. However, if you're innocent, why do you need it? If you're truly innocent, you should be able to just tell your story, and that would be the end of it. Um, and the lawyer, um, and so you, if you were truly innocent, you wouldn't need attorney-client privilege. Um, so because. Um, because morality is how we know what's just, and because the whole point of the um, of our democracy is to maximize the well-being of the most people, and that's the whole point of the Constitution, um, and because attorney-client privilege doesn't do this um, by falsely imprisoning people and putting them into the cycle of poverty, but because France's system, which values truth-seeking, um, leads to lower false convictions, and it maximizes the well-being of others. For all of those reasons, I affirm.